that, uh, where we've been, we looked at the creed, Jesus is Lord, that kind of comes back into form today, what we're looking at, Philippians, the hymn talks about Jesus being in the form of God, the Colossian hymn, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, we looked at 1 Corinthians 15, kind of that core creed, um, and there where Paul says, I pass on to you a first importance, first importance. What, you, what has been passed on to me, what I perceive, Paul says. Um, and then we looked at the complementary relationship between Paul and Jesus and how a lot of folks are trying to drive these two figures apart, and I think we did some good work there. Um, and then Ephesians 1 and 2 and then Romans 11, we looked at the last time we were together, and we looked at how Christianity, even in those most ancient creedal statements, is breaking down the walls that divide us, and in particular, that um, there's neither in Christ now, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, and we can go on with those divisions. So today, we're going to look at some hymns um, of Mary, Zachariah, and Simeon, that should say Simeon, not Simon. But um, next, work, next week, we'll work, look into some the book of Revelation. So if you think we ignore that book, boy, you've got another thing coming. Come on next week and check that out. Um, I've been reading this book called New Testament Christological Hymns by Matthew Gordley. Um, just giving you a heads up that some of my information is coming from there. Um, and I'm going to share some things that he presents in his book regarding hymns to the Greco-Roman world as a background for these three hymns that we're going to read today. So um, that's where we're headed, and I hope that you'll enjoy it. Now, also a reminder that we want you to start signing up for our Lay School of Theology. Um, Troy Trothbrugen, um, professor of New Testament at Wartburg Seminary, will be presenting information on the early church and how it informs us today. And um, he also has a book called Rooted in Renewing, which if you want to start reading and prep for the lay school, um, I see Sue has got one already. Look at that. Way to go, Sue. Well, um, so it's the place of Christ. Yes, yeah, that's right. Uh, Dave Hitch will be happy to give you a deal. <laughs> uh, so those are in the narthex that you can purchase. Those. I believe it's $15. So um, those of you who want to read that. You can also, if you're a... Amazon person, I'm sorry, if you are a digital, you know, whatever all those applications are, it is available. I know I got it in my, my tablet for my Nook. I don't buy too many print books anymore. So um, that it's available there too. So there you go. So that's for our lay school. So we've been doing this work. It's even maybe a complimentary um, prep for what Troy's going to do with us. We'll see how those um, inform each other. But let's move on here and take a look, quick look at some of the Greco-Roman world when it comes to him, since we're looking at some in the New Testament. Um, it's interesting that they're very much, yeah, I don't know if you know that much about Greek mythology and actually the worship of the Greek gods, but hymns and songs were a big part of worship uh, and very popular and common. This is from the Iliad. So the whole day long they sought to appease the god with songs, singing the beautiful, um, I think it's Paean, and that's just a song, or a, um, and the song, sons of the Achaeans, hymning the god that worketh afar, and his heart was glad as he heard. So the, the heart of the god was glad as they heard. Um, and this is from Gordley. In all ceremonies, be they daily exercises or solemn festivals, one feature recurs: the singing of hymns. They were recited in the temples, morning and night. They were chanted during processions. They were there. They were accompaniment for sacrifices. The song characteristic of the Asclepius worship was the Paean, a choral hymn with no music other than that of the cithara. That's like a lyre or a, a little stringed instrument. So um, we could go on, we can just, this, those are a couple of quotes to help you know, wow, not only was there this beautiful tradition in the Jewish world of the hymns and the psalms, that was present in the Greco-Roman world too. As we look at the purpose of these <laughs> hymns, um, we see that they kind of served three functions. They instructed as well as praise. They did, people, it was the way they praised their God, and they also gave some instruction. Um, and I think it sweeps them up into the participation and the reality of that God. And 
implications for life and ethics and focus, they usually had something to say with, about how we are to live. Um, when we look at now moving into the hymns of the Second Temple of Jer Judaism, so remember when it comes to history, um, uh, oftentimes they talk about the first temple and the second temple. Let me explain that just really quickly. So when the, the twelve tribes congealed into a nation and David made Jerusalem the capital of the nation, then he had his palace there and he was going to build a temple for the um, tabernacle that had gone with them all throughout the exodus, or I'm sorry, all throughout the wanderings in the wilderness. And so he made kind of a home in Jerusalem for the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle. But God says, no, I don't, you're not going to build me a house. But then Solomon comes along, uh, David's son, and he does get permission and blessing to build the temple. And so the temple's built in Jerusalem. That's called the first temple. When the Babylonians come along some 500 years later, um, that temple, or 400 years later, that temple is destroyed completely. And then after their exile in Babylon, they come back into Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple. And that temple was the one that stood into Jesus' day. So when we talk about Second Temple Judaism, it's kind of after the exile and they come back. Now, King Herod, of course, rebuilt that, didn't rebuild the temple, but he remodeled it, let's say that, and made it one of the great wonders of the world. Um, and so, when we look at hymnody during this time in Judaism, um, it definitely, as all, with all universally, it's, it's a vehicle of praise of God. It's the way it is for us today, but it also gave instruction. It was kind of this dual purpose. Um, and they also shaped the worldview, um, kind of gave them a countercultural um, identity in, in Judaism now. Because remember, Judaism was living within Hellenism, that is, uh, with the, the Greek, Rome, Greco Roman legacy and world. Most Jewish people didn't speak Hebrew anymore, they spoke Greek. Um, so about 70 years before Jesus, thereabouts, the Old Testament in Hebrew was translated into Greek. So that's how pervasive Hellenism was. So you've got the Greco-Roman world, but you've got Judaism that's, you know, keeping its identity and heritage strong in the midst of a culture that's very different than they are. Does that sound familiar? So, um, so that was, seems to be a part of hymnody too, was this sense of... Um, the sense of identity shaping um, purpose. So those were the purpose of the um, different hymns during that day. Just a quick aside, a footnote, it's not really where we're going today, but um, think about our hymnody today as we're going to hear Zachariah's song and Mary's song and Simeon's song. Um, if you look at most hymns, uh, and I constantly have to remind people of this, they serve a twofold purpose. They are a vehicle of our praising of God, but they are also instructive. So, um, you may not have a good voice. Now, I think everybody has a voice that God likes to hear. Um, but I know some people aren't confident in their musical ability or their voice or whatever. Um, don't shut the book or don't shut the bulletin. Because most of our hymns are instructive. See, a, a hymn goes two ways, us to God and God to us. They speak, they preach. And this is something that, like our modern praise hymns, which many people love, and I don't mind them myself either, um, the kind of, I love you, Jesus, you're so awesome, Jesus. You see, it's all praise. There's no real instruction um, coming. Now, again, I'm not making a point <coughs> at all about those. But um, I just want you to be aware of that, especially when maybe we do a hymn that you can't sing very well. Um, you know, don't get overly frustrated. Um, check out the words, okay? I mean, because it, it's a two-way street. But that's just a, and just like they were in the Greco-Roman world and for Judaism of, of old and of today. Okay? That's just a side note. Um, here's a little quote from Gordley in his book. Um, about 
these songs and poems, given that poems, songs, and hymns in praise of the divine ruler were common in antiquity, it is valuable to pause here and note the ways in which early Christian praises of Jesus align with those practices and also the ways in which they diverge from them. As we will see, some of the early Christians' use of hymnody tapped directly into those dynamics as Jesus is praised for his divine origin, exceptional accomplishments, and divine honors. This is what this is very much the same that a Greco, you know, a, a Greek citizen person or a Roman person might be praising their God for, you know, or even Caesar. A lot of the songs about Caesar would talk about his divine origin and his great accomplishments. So in the New Testament, we see these being applied to Jesus. Um, so we've got that um, there. But rather than recounting the blessings of empire, early Christian hymns took a different approach. From a worldview perspective, we can observe that they may have provided a kind of resistance to the imperial messages on display through hymns and a variety of other means. In those imperial songs, who was Lord? Caesar. Well, we'll see today, there's another Lord celebrated. Okay? Alright, so with that, and that was my little underlining emphasis there that I forgot to do while I read it, and <laughs> we're going to take a look at these texts now today. Alright, so let's start with Mary's song. Um, if you have Bibles, we're at Luke 1.46. This is, to put this in context, this is um, after Mary has encountered Elizabeth and the babe leaps in her womb. Um, and uh, some, well, they're not, they're not as ancient, but maybe some, some texts much later actually apply this, this passage to Elizabeth instead of Mary. But most people think that's a later change in a few manuscripts. But so this is, let's read this great Magnificat of Mary. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor upon the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promises he made for our ancestors to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. So here is this great Magnificat, which is um, also very similar to, if you want to make a mark to it, let's see if I pulled it up here. I think, no, I guess I didn't. But if you remember when Hannah um, was hoping for a child and um, she was told by God that she would bear a child, um, and she sings this great song of praise back in 1 Samuel. Um, so it's very much uh, in the flow and the feel of, of that, that um, song of Hannah back in the Old Testament. So I think what I want to do, even though it's a lot of text, I want to get all three of these songs on board. So, so now just keep going, and we're going to go to Zechariah's prophecy. Um, so remember, Zechariah didn't believe about Elizabeth, and the angel he couldn't talk after that. And finally, when he says, um, he writes on this tablet, his name will be John, referring to John the Baptist, then he can talk. And what does he do? He prophesies, or he sings this hymn. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, 
For he has looked favorably upon his people and redeemed them. So think about some, some verbs through this and through the Mary song. Redeemed, looked favorably. He raised up a mighty Savior. So we've got Mary rejoicing in God my Savior. And now he's, we've got, he has raised up a mighty Savior. For us in the house of his servant David. Note in Mary's song also there is this talk of Israel. And now we've got this, you know, coming out of the house of his servant David. Um, by the way, another little fun little side note. We found a little, little peak pottery that talk, refers to the house of David that goes back to, I think, 700 B.C. or so. So, we haven't quite got back to David yet, but we're, we're awful close. Um, so, that's kind of fun, a little side note. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that we would be saved. Now we've got the word saved again. And we've got Savior from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Let's take a note here that in Zechariah's prophecy, um, celebrating that, you know, John was born, that the saving has to do with their enemies and from the hand of all who hate them. Interesting. Thus he has shown mercy, the mercy promised to our ancestors, and has re remembered his holy covenant. The oath, whoops, the oath he swore to our ancestors, Abraham, to grant us that we being rescued, pretty sure that that's saving, rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God. The dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into ways of peace. So you look at these two hymns so far, and you see some connection, a connection to Israel, a connection to the house of David, that, that this is to Abraham, so this is a completion of the story, what's happening now. We call the event of Jesus Christ the Kairos, the once for all, the event of God fulfilling the whole story of the Hebrew Scriptures. And so both of these early Christian um, hymns kind of hold up um, what's happening as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, of the, the story from the beginning. I will come back and we're going to look at salvation in these hymns and also the function of Israel. All right, one more. Now let's get to, we can stop with the angels, with the little glory to God in the highest heaven on peace, those who he favors. That's kind of a hymn there. But we'll move on to when Jesus is named. And this is a part of the story that we often miss, and a lot of people are not very well aware of. So at the right time, as was you would do, um, for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Um, they offered sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of tur the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary according to the law, Simeon took him in his arms, excuse me, Mary, and praising God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. 
Okay, so that's a shorter one, and you guys are probably familiar with that, because if you grew up in the Lutheran Church or the Catholic tradition or the Episcopal tradition, this was um, oftentimes um, a part of the sending liturgy. Um, Matt, you, you're dismissing your servant in peace, according to your words, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Um, so, you know, that's kind of true when you think about what happens in worship. Um, so it's very appropriate. So we're familiar with that, but I want you to know where it comes from. So now let's do some conversation about these three together and the different themes. Um, when you think of salvation, and we'll start here and then we'll get, we'll go wherever we need to go with this. Um, when you think of salvation, and what I want you to talk at at your tables for just a minute, if someone says, what does salvation mean to you? What, what would you say? I, um, and there's, you, don't, there, you don't have to get it right. Okay? <laughs> what, what, just, just from you, whatever your story is, when you think of salvation, what, what would you say salvation is? Um, how would you define it? And I guess what I'm saying is salvation from what? Okay? If you're going to be saved in terms of things, you got to talk about what you're saved from. So just spend a few minutes in mean, your little group there. If you've got a group of uh, you know, like, um, four or five. Uh, I'd love to hear from some of what you share. Again, do not worry about correct answers or whatever at this point. What are some of the things that came up at your table when it comes to salvation? How do you define it? Save from what? Please. I call it, I call it restoration from decline. Restoration from decline. Okay. Excellent. Let me see here. Is this, this mic? Yeah. Good. Okay. We can these two up a little more. Good. Restoration from decline. Okay. Wait a second. Absolutely loneliness, yeah. which I think hell 
is. Even God is God. Right. Save us from that. And give us the hope of new heavens, new world. Yeah. Resurrection. Nice. So, in addition to, so you and you brought two things: the being saved from death. Um, and, and from, you know, we have different images of how we talk about hell, but mentioned that hell is being completely alone. Um, what was the name of that movie that Ken was cast away? Yeah. When I watched that movie, it was hard to watch that movie. Because it just got you into how alone he was. Oh, it was gut wrenching. I'm with you on that. So, salvation from that kind of aloneness, um, or, you know, is, is a good way to put it. Good. How else? Were there other things that you're saved from, or other ways that you define salvation as, as you came up? Sure. Well, I was a kid. Wayne, uh, can you help her with just getting it more? In World War II. Yeah. And we didn't. Yeah, well there you go. Nice. Nice. When you when you know that's the place where you experience your salvation, you go no matter what. So you make it there. Okay, excellent. Um, let's look at some quotes here. Um, and then let's unpack this some more um, when it comes to salvation. This is from a commentary on this text. It's the Augsburg Commentary Series. Even the parallelism of Hebrew poetry indicates that the soul magnifying the Lord and the Spirit rejoicing in God point forward to God as Savior. While Mary speaks of God as my Savior, this is not merely a personalistic statement. The entire... Magnificat, that's Mary's song, she magnifies the Lord, so they call it the Magnificat, may be read as an exposition of what it means that God is the Savior who is also my Savior. And the Benedictus of Zechariah comes back to the term salvation three times. Furthermore, the angel announces the birth of Jesus to the shepherds in terms of his being a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So there's an element to this when we talk about salvation. Is it, are we talking about it? Typically in America, especially in the, the realm of the great revivals of the you know hundreds of years past, we typically talk about, are you saved? How do we think about it? We think about it as an individual. I can't I personally say it. Mary says, my God, my Savior. And yet, the other hymns, along with that, talk about the redemption, the saving of what? God's people, as a group, as a whole. So we have to think about, anytime we talk about salvation, we have to think about, are we talking about individual salvation, group salvation, both and, you know, this type of thing. Please. Yes, absolutely. But the word Gentile shows up in that. So okay. is that the newbie? Yes, yeah. all right. Or something? So David's pointing out another aspect of salvation. Is it personal or corporate, but is it for everybody? Or is it for just the Jewish people and the nation of Israel? And Simeon quotes um, this sense that salvation has come to the Gentiles. And so that's another aspect that we've got to talk about when it comes to salvation. Especially if we are thinking about these, these poetry, this poetry, you know, that they these people obviously said, but seem to be kind of taking us back to the earliest viewpoints of Christians. That was God's new act in Christ just for the Jewish nation or for the nation of Israel. It is not a new thing. There are many strands in the Hebrew Bible where it talks about a light to the nations. That comes from Isaiah. So that's there. Um, I think the tension that we have to get with the New Testament period is that by 
the time Jesus comes along, there's a real animosity between the Gentiles and the Jews. Um, the Gentiles, in the mind of most Jewish people, were the Romans who were their oppressors. And so I think it's clear, um, at least if we go from the New Testament, that the rabbis and the, the Jewish establishment had kind of tucked those, that stuff about salvation coming to the Gentiles, <laughs> kind of had put it away. But, you know, these, these hymns of Zechariah and Simeon, and, and uh, you know, even though as they hold up Israel as of first importance, that the Gentiles are brought back to the fore. Um, we'll see this especially, it's interesting, these hymns, they are in the Gospel of Luke, because it's in Luke that we clearly see, as this evangelist writes, a concern for those Gentiles. Like, hey, this salvation, we've been way too narrow in our thinking here. Um, some, some stories come to mind that are only in Luke. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Samaritans were not thought to be Jews. So here's the Samaritans, the hero of that story. Would you say Simeon was thinking out of the box at that time in terms of the Jewish community? Um, was that emerging, as you were to say? Yeah, well, I would say he's, he's taking out of the box something that had been kept away, that had been kind of... Down at the bottom. Down at the bottom, <laughs> yeah. Um, he's simply quoting Old Testament scripture in truth. He's quoting Isaiah here. So, um, it's not something he's inventing, that's for sure. It was there, but it's maybe unearthing something as he, as he proclaims this. And, and, you know, and probably when people hear this, they would go, oh yes, this is, this is great. But, um, um, think about when Jesus starts his ministry in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4. Um, let me just see if I can go there real quick. Um, so, um, am I in the commentary? No one. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, loop for. Um, after the temptation, uh, Jesus goes up to the synagogue and he begins to preach. And this is what he, he takes the book of Isaiah. Um, and this is, I believe, from the six, Isaiah 61, yeah. Um, and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. You heard some of that in Mary's song, didn't you? And the poor, which we haven't even got to yet, especially in Mary's song, is probably the Jewish folks would have understood themselves as those people. They were not the people in power. They were not the Herods and the Caesars and the you know all of that. Um, so um, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, what's interesting about this is that this. Some people look at this as the jubilee, but this really would be when God's people once again are, are brought, you know, back into good stead, I guess you could say. And then, in Isaiah 60, I guess we could go there. Um, if we go to Isaiah 61, but look what happens. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, Jesus stops. You see that? What did he leave off? They have vengeance. So what happens back here in Luke is that he rolls up the scroll and he puts it down and everybody says, woohoo, this is great. Because they're thinking, yes, Jewish folks are going to be restored and the Gentiles are going to get their um, uppers. And then he starts quoting where God used a widow of Zarephath, a Gentile. And he starts quoting uh, Naaman, where Naaman was healed, who was a Gentile. Um, and what do they want to do? 
when they heard these things, and all the synagogue was filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill where they were, where the town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff and pass him through their midst. He went away. So, Simeon's song, they, I appreciate you bringing that up, that this salvation is for all people. It holds up the special place of Israel, but it says Gentiles have a part of it. So, well, my last comment, I guess, please. the Jewish community at that time, the hierarchies, were not accepting Jesus as a salvation or a fulfilling the prophecy or any of that. And you're saying you seem to be ahead of the curve. Simeon is definitely ahead of the curve. Um, he's someone that's in the temple looking for the salvation of God, and as Luke tells us, the Spirit had given him that you're going to get to see it. And he says, now I've seen it. Quickly forgot. Absolutely. Um, but note, note that in the early Christian conviction, there is a, the, the place of Israel, the redemption of the house of David, the, the Israel, but then this also includes the Gentiles. And I think that's important for us, just a quick note. We don't, we don't want to give up God's special place for, the, for Israel, for the Jewish people, um, while at the same time we... You know, celebrate that that salvation wasn't just exclusively for them. And remember last week where we saw that even in the temple there was a court for the Gentiles, the outermost part, um, they could only go so far. Well, Paul says now that dividing wall has been broken down. Um, so really, in Christ, we're not Jew and Gentile anymore. We're people. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's a helpful thing to, to take note of. Excellent. Um, all right. Excellent. Excellent. Let's see. Let's go back. Pastor Bill. Please, Jim. Please. And it might be relevant, but I'm just curious if, um, if, if, if it was common knowledge back then that the Jews, amongst the Gentiles, that the Jews were waiting for a Messiah, was that commonly known to think among those who were not Jews, or would that have been? I think that it was well known that there was enough interaction, as I'm thinking about some of the other sources, um, that it was fairly that the interaction between the Jewish people and the Roman world was enough that they would have been very well knowing, expecting and knowing that the folks were expecting a savior. And the reason I say that is because of some of the Jewish rebellions that happened, the one that happens after Jesus. Um, and we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Jewish folks were very much attuned to a savior. And so where that would go is these zealots who were fight, you know, in a military fashion with the Romans, they would know where they were coming from, so to speak. It's like, oh, you know, this guy may, they think is going to be their Messiah, so we're going to take care of him um, to, keep, to keep things down. So I, I would say we could say with pretty well confidence that it would be kind of not understood well, but understood enough to where it's like, yeah, that's what these guys, these folks are expecting. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Good question. Okay. That begs the question. That says, were they thinking then that their personal salvation was a world of earthly kings that would rid them of the Romans? Okay, so now we're going to thank you. Salvation for everlasting life. Thank you. So now we have to ask the question save from what? This is, a, this is a, in our last five minutes here, this is an essential part of the conversation when it comes to the mission of the church today and what the gospel was from the very beginning. Um, I wonder if I've got, I did a little bit of a word study here. This is Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the Bible. And then there's a little Kittle. The big Kittle is like this. <laughs> it takes every Greek word in the New Testament and breaks it down by the use of the word in the Greek time and Judaism and ancient Judaism, modern Judaism, etc. And so the little kittle is one volume. 
And this is from the one volume. And I think, Dave, the best answer to this is what this one um, author says about the relationship between soteria, that's the word for save in New Testament, and later Jews, Judaism in the Greek world. New Testament soteria does not refer to physical health, political liberation, or release from demonic powers. Now, that's partly true and partly not true. Sometimes when Jesus says, your faith has saved you, did it save their soul? In some cases, it made them well. They were physically best. So salvation is not simply a spiritual thing. I think that would be, this, this, I think that sentence is a little too strong. But it's certainly not just a physical thing or well-being um, type of deal. It goes beyond that. It has to do strictly with the relationship with God, and hence it can be achieved neither by reason nor contrition. The problem is that of sin, not of imprisonment of a divine particle in the material world, as in Gnosticism. So Greek Gnosticism, the secret religions of the day, um, believed that you know the soul, the spark of deity, is imprisoned by this physical body, and you've got to try and separate the two. And you know, Shirley MacLaine, in her modern book, said it perfectly: "Out on a limb, you got to get out of the body. That's in the spirit realm. Um, that's Gnosticism. Um, that's not salvation from the New Testament standpoint. A call brings salvation, but not the call that awakens." or bemuses the divine self, nor do sacramental acts of bringing salvation by initiation into the story of a mythical God, as in the mystery religions of Greece. The work of Jesus of Nazareth brings salvation from judgment by the forgiveness of sins. So this is, uh, this is gets at your point, Dave. Um, all are under judgment, none can escape it unaided, and salvation comes through the word of the cross, which is God's power to salvation for all who believe. Only God can save, but hearers can accept or reject the offer, and have thus to work out their own salvation, as Paul says in Philippians. Salvation is not just future, as in the Pharisaic Judaism, which believed in a resurrection, they they believe that. Nor an enhancement of the present as at Qumran, that's the Dead Sea Scroll people, um, you know, that it's going to happen right now and we're going to have all these horrible world powers destroyed. Nor so strongly present as agnostic. It is present for with Christ a new eon has come and believers are drawn into it as they die and rise with him. So in essence, the fancy language here is that as being connected into Christ, we have salvation, um, which means that, as some of you said, the forgiveness of sins, and that's there in these early songs um, of Simeon, and um, God and God's mercy has used me, he's looked upon my lowly estate, in other words, is it us that save ourselves? No, it's like we're down on the bottom and God chose a lowly little Mary to, to bring about God's salvation. Um, so, so that's the trick. You know, I think, as I read the New Testament, salvation is indeed sometimes being made whole physically, having peace, having well-being in the present, but it's most often described as in forgiveness of sins, that we need that, and the destruction of death. The Apostle Paul certainly, you know, brings that in, and we just simply look at Jesus was put to death, and he was raised from the dead. So death, you know, has lost its victory. So, so it's a combo. I don't want to just spiritualize it, but I also don't want it to be just a this-worldly thing. Does that make sense? Um, I, I will make, please. Keep reading. That's it. Keep reading. Okay, please. Okay, yet their hope is set on a future salvation um, where their transformation comes. Creation is freed and God's rule over every power is manifested. Negatively, salvation is deliverance from wrath and positively, it is the attainment of glory. Either way, the message of Christ crucified and risen fixes the content. Say, Alleluia. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I like the way he says that it fixes the content of salvation. Hey, this is a huge deal. Um, uh, in our Thursday class, uh, we were, I 
forget what got us on the subject of liberation theology, as it's sometimes called, where salvation really is salvation from the oppressive forces, you know, that are oppressing the lowly people um, in the world, the downtrodden, the, um, and when they read Mary's Magnificat, that God, you know, looked upon the, the lowly servant and ticked down the rich, they go, yes, that is, that means, and I think rightly so, that means I'm part of the story too, not just those rich and powerful. The next step a lot of the liberation theologians though go to is that, well, that's what salvation is. It's a this worldly thing. And then you start hearing a lot of Marxist kind of terminology. Um, and in some, where, some, in some ways it works, in some ways it doesn't. Um, but their critique of traditional Christianity is that Christianity has just been concerned about the afterlife. What did Karl Marx say? Religion is the what? Phobia of the people. A lot of we, we've heard this. Um, so there is a critique that needs to be had because the salvation we have when it comes to forgiveness of sins and the defeat of death has everything to do with how we live now. Um, so, but the, the liberation theology's answer, I think, goes too far the other way and makes the kingdom of God something we can achieve if we just get the right political system set. Um, and that's, I think, naive as well. Or misses the boat as well. So, um, so yeah. Look at these early Christian hymns. What is what is salvation? We hear about the forgiveness of sins. We do hear a hope for the restoration of Israel. But then, just in as much as we see that, we see um, that um, there are some some differences. Look at this. This is from Acts. So I love to look at Acts, Luke, and that and Acts together because Acts is the second volume. These are some of the sermons and preaching in the book of Acts. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, <coughs> that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. How does salvation come through repentance and forgiveness? And Jesus is the savior. He's also the Lord. Um, how do you become saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. Not have the right, you know, so it's just really clear. Um, how about Acts 22? Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear his own voice. For you will be his witnesses to all the world of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. So, baptism, faith, repentance... Um, becoming connected to Christ um, is, is a real key. Um, and then finally, let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. What happens in the end of the book of Acts, and Paul will talk about this in his letters, is that the rejection of Israel on the whole oh, says, okay, now it goes to the Gentiles. Um, as Gentiles, we can never go, oh, look at us, aren't we special? Because as Paul says, we're just a grafted, you know, branch into the root. Um, and Paul always believed and hoped for the, the complete believing of all of Israel. And he just simply holds, and we live in that tension and that hope now. But, but now, salvation is to the Gentiles. So my question is, is salvation the restoration of Israel as like some kind of physical nation? Um, that's what a lot of people were hoping for, but I think the New Testament holds up that it's it's not just this worldly. It goes much beyond that. And if it goes to the Gentiles, then salvation involves um, something more than just a physical nation. Um, the role of the current nation of Israel is a whole other subject and, a, and a, one that needs a lot of work and attention. But I'll just simply say this for now, that when it comes to the church's mission today, and this is where I'll finish, um, we need to be clear about what we mean about salvation. And because I believe that people begin connected to Christ, they are saved from the loneliness that Ken talked about. They're saved from their sins. 
They're saved from their, the, the bondage to sin and death. And in that saving, they have the promise of life eternal, not just, you know, wholeness now. There is that promise for us now, but it, it goes on beyond the grave. That's what we have. That's what we have to offer. Um, and I think we need to keep that at the center of the church's mission. And I think it goes all the way back to these early hymns that, that we just uh, heard today. Hey, let's come back next week and look at the book of Revelation and see um, some of these songs and hymns um, that are there in the book of Revelation. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. All right. I hope this was helpful. Go in peace, serve the Lord.